The Subcommittee on Intelligence and Counterterrorism will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare the committee in recess at any point. Good morning. It is uh, my honor to be opening up the first public hearing as the Chair of the Subcommittee on Intelligence and Counterterrorism. Our subcommittee is meeting today to examine state and local responses to the growing threat of domestic terrorism and violent extremism. Before we begin, I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge the horrific violence we've seen in Atlanta and in Boulder over the past week. I know we're all grieving for the 18 Americans um, going about their daily life at a spa, at the supermarket, who have been senselessly torn from their families. Now, this subcommittee is charged with combating domestic terrorism and violent extremism, among other things, and we are united by the conviction that we simply cannot allow violence to be normalized as part of our politics. Uh, but we have to acknowledge that we've allowed these monstrous acts, act, acts of mass violence to become normalized as part of our society. Um, while the investigations are ongoing, we cannot ignore the anguish of our Asian American communities um, that they are feeling right now, nor can we deny the intelligence community's warning just last week that lone wolf actors driven by hate for swaths of our fellow citizens pose a growing threat of, quote, mass, ca mass casualty attacks like the ones we've just seen against innocent Americans here at home. There is nothing political about protecting Americans from violence in our communities, and I am determined to work together with each and every, me every member of the subcommittee, regardless of party, to do just that. Um, uh, since this is our first hearing, um, I want to just take a second to make all the members of the subcommittee aware of a few procedural items. First, in accordance with the procedures laid out by the chairman and ranking member of the full committee, members will be recognized on a strict seniority basis, regardless of time of arrival. Second, I'm proud of the tradition of bipartisan cooperation the subcommittee has enjoyed in the past. I want to remind and encourage members to continue operating in a manner that is respectful of other members, our witnesses, and in accordance with the House rules. To be very specific, sections 368, 369, and 370 of Jefferson's manual prohibit members from imputing the motives of another member, a senator, or the current president. I would ask that this subcommittee proceed with its work um, on the issues before us this Congress and that all members do so in a respectful manner. With that, I recognize myself for a brief opening statement. For the better part of the last two decades, since the fateful morning of September 11th, 2001, our country's framing of our national security interests have revolved largely around threats posed by terrorist organizations halfway around the world, in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, North Africa. But for those of us with a background in national security, like myself and many others on this panel, we have seen a troubling trend in recent years. Here at home, extremist rhetoric online, rising political tensions, and the proliferation of disinformation have brought us to a boiling point. We've seen flashes of it in the last few years, moments that, has give, that have given us a window into the threat posed by violent domestic groups. In Charlottesville in 2017, in my own district, Lansing in 2020, and tragically on January 6th in the nation's capital. The attack on the Capitol on the 6th and the warnings we received from law enforcement and intelligence leaders in the months leading up to and weeks since have made clear that while external threats remain, the single greatest threat to our country right now is the threat of domestic terrorism and the tensions and polarization between us. For some people, the division um, that's rife in our country right now will lead them to climb that ladder of escalation use violence or the threat of violence for political goals and become domestic terrorists. Taking on this threat is our top priority. This is why our first hearing as a full committee less than a month after the attack on January 6th was focused on domestic terrorism and why today's hearing, the first subcommittee hearing for the Homeland Security Committee in this Congress, will continue that critical discussion. Um, as a former CIA analyst, I want to take a moment to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of the scope and scale of these threats and the words we use to describe them. First, the threat we face. Um, a week ago today, the Secretary of Homeland Security, Ali Mayorkas, testified in front of our full committee that, quote, domestic violent extremism represents, quote, the greatest threat in the homeland right now. 
That threat isn't going away. A few weeks ago, FBI Director Ray testified that domestic terrorism investigations have grown from around 1,000 in September to about uh, 2,000 after the attack on the 6th. Um, and Director Ray testified in front of our committee last Congress that we now have more open investigations around domestic extremism than we do of cases of individuals connected to foreign terrorist organizations. And last week, the Director of National Intelligence, in collaboration with Justice and Homeland Security, released an, an assessment warning that domestic violent extremists pose an elevated risk to the homeland this year. This assessment cautions that extremists will continue to be radicalized and will mobilize around narratives of election fraud, pandemic restrictions, conspiracy theories, and the attack on the 6th. Um, the threat assessment also laid out important terminology that our intelligence and law enforcement officers use to describe these threats, and it's important that we get on the same page. The intelligence community's foremost concern is, quote, racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, RMVEs, as well as, quote, militia violent extremists, MVEs. Our intelligence agencies have assessed that these groups pose the, uh, at present the most lethal domestic threat. Racially motivated extremists are the most likely to conduct mass casualty attacks against civilians, and militias are likely to target law enforcement and government personnel and facilities. The agency's uh, assessments notes that the threat is compounded by tech platforms that make radicalization, recruitment, and mobilization easier. Um, as we sit here today, we are facing a new reality. The post 9-11 era um, of security where the threats come from abroad is over. In the 20 years of the post 9-11 era, um, they came to an end on January 6th. The new reality is that we have to that we have to come to terms with is that it's uh, our extremists here at home seeking to exploit internal divisions um, that pose the greatest threat. Um, and um, uh, this is why we're focusing on these challenges today in this hearing. The issue is not theoretical for me and others who are on the screen. In my own district last year, federal and state authorities managed to disrupt a plot by at least 14 men to kidnap and kill our governor, Gretchen Whitmer. The group spied on the governor's vacation home, conducted firearms and combat training, um, and practiced building explosives. They planned to detonate a bomb under a highway bridge to distract local authorities as they kidnapped our governor to relocate her to Wisconsin for a, quote, trial. These plotters weren't affiliated with Al-Qaeda or ISIS. They didn't hail from war-torn regions halfway around the world. They were Americans. And um, they were radicalized right here at home. These men were affiliated with a group called the Wolverine Watchmen, a violent extremist group threatening to start a civil war here in the United States. And even just this week, another 22-year-old man from my district was, uh, who was affiliated with this group was charged with two felony counts related to modifying a semi-automatic weapon. This is exactly what the FBI and DHS have been sounding the alarm over. In this moment, groups like this that po are, are the ones that pose the greatest uh, threat to our safety and our way of life. I am very, very grateful for the work of law enforcement at both the state and federal level who disrupted this terrible plot. Michigan Attorney General uh, Dana Nessel, who is here with us today, has led the majority of the charges against these defendants. And she has charged these uh, eight of the, def of the extremists with, quote, providing material support for terrorist acts. And two of the eight were additionally charged by her office with the, quote, threat of terrorism. A.G. Nessel's work highlights the very reason we have called this hearing. Um, it lays out, today we'll hear about the patchwork of state and local and federal laws that we have to prosecute violent extremists. Um, as many of you know, although domestic terrorism is defined in federal law, there are no specific federal domestic terrorism charges. And while some of these investigations may result in, uh, may, some investigations do result in serious charges, such as hate crimes and gun charges. And in the case of January 6th, we've had perpetrators charged with conspiracy and sedition. Many of these domestic terrorism related investigations will not progress as terrorism-related charges. This is a major reason why we're here today, as I said, to understand the legal authorities we do and do not have to prosecute domestic terrorists, and in particular, to understand whether federal legislation is or is not needed to tackle these threats. In the meantime, states have tried to devise their own systems for countering domestic terrorism and hate-fueled violence, but those approaches differ. 
And in states like Michigan and Texas, for example, those differences can be significant. Um, so today's hearing will allow us to hear from law enforcement leaders in three states about how they're working to combat this, these threats and the legal tools they have and don't have at their disposal. Um, we will also in the subcommittee um, examine how states coordinate federal government uh, with the federal government to combat the threat and how the federal government can better complement state and local communities efforts. Um, our state and local law enforcement, our attorneys general are on the front lines of this fight um, and it's great that we have them here today to speak directly um, to the public on this. Um, so um, uh, I will just say, um, so one of the things that I'm personally looking at is some legislation to ensure that DHS has the tools that they need from an intelligence um, analysis perspective to better understand these threats. Um, one of the things we know is we just don't do a ton of data collection. We just don't understand the magnitude of the threat. And I hope this is an area where myself and the other side of the aisle can work to improve the Department of Homeland Security's capabilities. Um, in addition um, to our witnesses, I just want to take a brief moment to thank um, the attorneys general from District of Columbia and Oregon and the National District Attorneys um, Association for their work on this topic. And note that some statements they um, have submitted for the record. I'm eager to hear from our witnesses today about where we can improve um, uh, and where we can, you know, follow through with that guarantee of safety to every American. Uh, uh, I know that we um, want to set a strong tone, a bipartisan tone in here in this subcommittee. With that, I thank the witnesses for being here and I recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fluger, for an opening statement. 